recording. You started right now, brother. Thank you on CD. I want you looking, everybody, at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Kind of was confirmed as I opened my mouth today and I said this to Brother Lance. Either today or yesterday, I just thought about this study. And it came alive in me. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Minister, pulpit or pew, pulpit or layman. This is really going to minister unite. The evangelists that are here, the prison evangelists, street evangelists. This is going to minister to all of us tonight because it is the key right now with the great falling away that we see happening. And that falling away, I believe, is not just those that were, you know, that's Pentecostal people's scripture for that you can backslide and lose out. And, and it's true. Uh, the falling away of, of, of people that have been there, but also a falling away from truth and people that's never known it. It's never been there. It seems like they're getting further away from truth. They've never been in a room with truth. They've never given it a chance in their life. And still you see them next year and they're even further away from it than what they've ever been. And they've never known it. Then we see the church getting further away from the truth and the church falling away in many different areas. Even the pulpits have lost their zeal and lost that passion that we kind of talked about last night. So in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, I want to bring this to your attention where the text will mean more as I get into this. Listen to this. Paul goes to heaven. Again, not Honolulu, heaven. He's in heaven. He said, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He said, I'm telling you, I've had visions and dreams. It was neither one of them. So he said, the day, get it out, that it was vision or dream. It was neither one of them. He said, I'm telling you, it wasn't the rapture, but I was there. I was raptured before the rapture. And Paul is saying, I walked in heaven hand in hand with the Lord. So the Lord literally zapped him there, took him there, and sent him back to the earth. So he has had an experience with the Lord like none other. None other. Elijah got to go, but he didn't get to come back. So Paul comes back, and many things are discussed while they're there. And long story short, the Lord said, walking him around heaven, hand in hand, look at him right here. He says, Paul, you can mention that. He points out things, but he said, don't mention that. I'm sending you back to the earth to write the Word of God, prompted by the Spirit. You will write two-thirds of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But don't mention that. But I want you to go into detail over here. I believe in 1 Corinthians 7, he writes to the Pentecost Church at Corinth. And I believe one thing they discussed was divorce and remarriage between the church believers. Not the world. Because he goes into detail. If the unbeliever be pleased to stay with the believing wife, don't put him away. Won't born again woman, you can win your husband, your lost husband through your conversation, your actions, your attitude, everything else. God will honor and he'll bring him in. You live in as a believer in the same house with him. But if the unbeliever depart, let him go. Let him depart. Why? A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Showing God does not throw the baby out with the bathwater. He, he reviews every case what denominations should have been doing. He don't throw them all in the same category and put, well, divorce is divorce. It isn't. It's common sense without even reading the word. Yes. But if the unbeliever depart, let him depart. Where does he get all this? How, why do you think they discuss it in heaven? Because Paul turned and said on that issue, that subject, I speak this by permission, but this is by commandment. Wow. I speak this by permission, and this is given unto you by commandment. So in other words, permission meant... This is my opinion. He wasn't real clear about this. But on this, he gave me a commandment. Tell him. Wow. So people in the church or wherever that jump around from bed to bed, they commit adultery. And they cause the person that might have been married for the first time, that hooks up with them, they cause them to commit adultery. You can't get away from that. It's plain as the nose in your face, and yet people in our culture want to go all around it. That's right. All right. So this is by commandment. I wouldn't take a chance on it. This is by permission. He comes back from heaven to the earth, and as soon as he gets back, the time lies, he hadn't been back that long. And he writes in 2 Corinthians, the second letter to the Pentecost church, chapter 4, verse 7, 
And he says, why? We have this treasure. The treasure, he means, is the spiritual things of God. The blood, the life in the blood of Christ. It means more to me now, he said, than it's ever been. He has no trouble with faith right now. He just got back from the Lord. Heaven, eye to eye. We have this treasure, gifts of the Spirit, power of God, resurrection power, raise the dead. We have this treasure, but then he says, but it's in earthen vessels. Wow, human. It's okay to be a human. <laughs> we have this treasure, he says, but it's in earthen vessels. Why? Look at this. Verse 7. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. A man who just got back from heaven, and he says when he comes back to the fallen Adamic world, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. Wow. Persecuted, so a trip to heaven coming back to the earth does not block you from persecution. He leaves heaven Comes back and gets persecuted. But not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Watch this, Christians. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Where do you bear it? In your body. Wow. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. In our mortal flesh. If you've ever watched a boxing match, there's something that happens that very few people catch. It's a lingo that the trainer of the boxer knows his boxer. And the trainer has something, in other words, lingo going on, communication with the referee. That trainer that spends so much time with that boxer, leading him, training him, cutting the fat, building the strength, working on the stamina, working on the punch, the ability to take punches. He knows his boxer. The referee knows his stuff, but he don't know that boxer like the trainer of the boxer does. You will see in every real deal, not fake championship wrestling, <laughs> cage fighting, usually boxing. You will look at the trainer, he'll have a white towel around his neck as he stands at the rope watching. As his trained boxer gets put in the corner, you'll see him take the towel off of his neck. The trainer has the towel in his hand. He watches the eyes of his boxer that is being severely hit. He watches where possibly the boxer can no longer guard himself through weakening and pain. Maybe he's leaving out a concussion standing up. He recognizes a severe concussion when it first happened. The trainer's very careful, but to save his boxer where he can come back later, it's called throwing in the towel. That when that boxer that only the trainer knows and the ref hadn't even stepped in to stop it yet, the boxer, the trainer will see. And in just a minute, you'll see the towel began to be thrown in. When the towel is thrown in, there's no picking it up. Automatically, when the towel is thrown in, the referee steps in, the trainer into the fight. It's in the lingo. The boxer, the, the referee honors the trainer's decision because he knows the price that there will be to pay if that boxer is allowed to continue to go on. Tonight, the key message, one of the key messages as we live in this, this condition that we're in from the pulpit to the pew, whether you have a ministry or you're fed by a ministry, I want to talk about tonight, whole Hold the towel. Hold the towel. Whatever you got to do, the Lord is screaming out right now. We're almost at the end. There's no doubt about it. Things are wrapping up like crazy. Yes. But I am seeing pulpits and pews 
throw in the towel left and right. I'm going to lay this white towel on this podium tonight with that in mind, what I've just presented to you. And as you look at this towel throughout this message with what I'm going to give you, the meat, it's in the milk message, it's a meat message, and I will tenderize, and I will break down where you can get it tonight. I know that experiences in life teaches us more than the classroom. I forgot much algebra, I forgot geometry, honestly, I never needed it. I never use it, ever, in anything that I ever do. But I never, ever forget the experiences that I had. I go far back as a little bitty boy. And the depth of the bad that happened is rooted in me. I can remember it. The depth of the great things that happened to me growing up, I can remember it. Because experiences, there's something about them, teaches us. You don't have to memorize them. You will always remember them. Paul made a statement, I'm perplexed. He said, we, his followers that are named or not named, we are perplexed, but we want you to know we're not, we're not throwing in the towel. We're not telling you we're perplexed so you'll feel sorry for us and throw a pity party for us, but we are perplexed, but we are not in despair. Now, perplexity describes a dilemma. Mr. Webster, Webster's Dictionary was a born-again Christian. When he wrote Webster's Dictionary, this is the definition that he gave us. When you're in a dilemma, it simply means when there's no visible reason for what has just occurred in a life. I think the thing that happens above all things that we see that bring us into perplexity more than anything else is when bad things happen to great people. Bad things that happen to great people. We discussed today the Blaze family. The Blaze family. From a school bus running over a seven-year-old daughter. And Brother Blaze of Tabernacle of Praise in Hannibal saw his young girl drinking a cup of coffee out the window on a cold winter day in Missouri. Salem, Missouri. He saw the back dual wheels run over the upper body, the head of his little seven-year-old girl. We later see his youth pastor's son, Keith, while Brother Blaze is in India. And on television, they're searching for him. He sees himself in India. When Keith, back in Hannibal, Missouri, had a head-on collision with another youth, taking him home from a youth service. 18-wheeler, I guess it was, hit him and killed Keith, his son, as a long trip back from India, where he and Sister Blaze. Other things, from breast cancer and Sister Blaze to later the death of Brother Blaze, a heart attack in his house. And we go on and on with many fill-ins and yet their tenacity to continue on. Brother and Sister Blaze is a very impressive, never really quit God. They got mad at God a few times, and he understood that, and ultimate perplexity hit that pulpit and that parsonage. They faked it well, where you wouldn't see it. But I'm telling you, there's no doubt in my mind, there was a few times I bet they picked up the towel. But something about it, they always laid it back down. Or they put it over their shoulder and just walked. Very impressive of what real biblical trust and faith is all about. When bad things happen to great people, you can flip the coin. Sometimes great things happen to bad folks. Here is what causes more people, my observation, to pick up the towel and, and contemplate throwing it in and forgetting it. More than anything else, watch this statement. We all reap what we sow. No matter your name, your name doesn't matter. And your father's accomplishments don't matter. And it don't matter if you're Billy Graham's children. We all reap what we sow. You ready? But here's the booger of all of them right here. Sometimes you reap what other people sow. One of the hardest things that causes people to reach for the tithe is when they've sown good, they've sown the kingdom, they've given it everything they got, and they began to reap what other people sow around them. 
It's when pastors go through hell on earth, when they've given it everything they got, and still bad happens in the church or whatever. Listen, people turn, people do their deal, people are doing whatever. Listen to me what I'm saying. And the trouble of all of it is hanging in there and not throwing in the towel. There's no doubt about it. Giving your life to the kingdom and bad happens. Young powerful preacher crosses a line one night or a drunk does that I knew. A drunk that crossed the line and hit a young powerful preacher. 30 something years old with three or four kids. Killed the preacher. And the drunk walked away from the crash with one, without a glass sliver in his body. At the funeral, walking to the head or the foot of the coffin, and people, me and the evangelist, wanted me to give them the answer. When they came by, shaking their head, why, how? How could this happen? What's going on? And I told them, I don't know. I never could understand 911 when 911 happened. When those demon-possessed terrorists were allowed by God. He didn't cause it, but he allowed it. How are you going to argue with me on that? See, this is things people never talk about. You just think it. And it causes you to pick up the towel and wave it because you wonder about it. I mean, if I'd have been God and those demon-possessed Islamic terrorists that have flown the planes toward the buildings with over 3,000 people in them, I'd have just reached my big God hand down, my sovereign hand, grabbed the two planes and taken them out of the air and landed them like a toy. I'd have landed them, but I'm not God. He didn't prompt it. He didn't use it or cause it. Things happen in a fallen Adamic world. That some things we understand and some things we don't. But I'll tell you this. You can't argue with me on this. He allowed it. He allowed it. Then he allowed the one to go hit the Pentagon. Then he allowed the one to crash in Pennsylvania. I learned years ago, you've got to be a little bit optimistic in the ministry or you're going to be in trouble. You've got to believe that the best is going to happen. But until the best gets here and the people all around you are picking up the tile and waving it, thinking about throwing it. You can see it in their eyes. According to Paul, there is a difference in perplexity and there's a difference in falling in the category of despair. I saw in the 80s the fad of positive thinking come through. I, I saw it when it looked like Scientology. As guys in the spirit-filled pulpits began to get weird on me. They literally began to, everything was about psyching up the mind. Psych up the mind. Get the mind psyched up. I am not sick. I am not sick. I am not sick. When they're laid in hospitals with 50 pounds gone off their body and tubes all in their body. It became silly. It became ridiculous. It became, I don't know, a psyched up. Everything was from the neck up. Neck up. Their spiritual experience was from the neck up instead of the spirit man. Listen to me in the heart from the neck down. I learned years ago, if you never had any trouble, what good would faith be? I learned years ago, if nobody ever got sick, what good would the stripes on his back be? Amen. If nobody was lost, how great would salvation be? If there wasn't a literal hell, listen to me, heaven wouldn't be as sweet. I'm going to tell you right now, I, I got as much faith in hell as I do heaven. It's equal. It's on equal grounds. I'm not 70-30. I got 100% faith in hell and 100% faith in heaven. Amen. People say in testimony services all the time, they stand up, some of the older saints. Anybody got to tell you, yeah, Lord, I just, I just want to go to heaven and see Jesus. All I'm thinking about is seeing Jesus. I told someone, blew him away a while back. I said, I'm going to tell you something. Don't walk out, let me finish. The number one reason I want to go to heaven is not to see Jesus. Number one reason I want to go to heaven, I read about hell. I read about hell. That surpasses the seeing Jesus still. I read about hell, and I ain't going to hell. I ain't made no sex worth it. There's no amount of money worth it. There's no fame worth it. I, look at me, I'm not going to hell. I read about it. I know that Luke 16 rich man story. It's not a parable. There was a rich man. He went there. He's still there tonight. And there's no hope for him to get out. Amen. The number one reason I want to go to heaven, I read about hell and I believe in it. Yeah. Number two is seeing Jesus. Amen. Number three is seeing relatives. And some of them are, that three is way down the list on some of it. <laughs> it sounds bad because I know Stephen, yes, some of them made it. I'm not sure if I really want to see them or not. I don't know what I'm talking about. 
They made it by grace, if you know what I mean. I don't understand. When I go through a revival and I pray for a preacher, ate up with cancer, and he lives. Next week, I pray for one, and he dies. I pray Monday night, he dies Tuesday morning. I'm not being unreal. I'm being real. I'm not an evangelist that gets up and says, see that hand? Watch that hand. Let me put that hand in the spotlight and turn it for you like a diamond. Every hand, that, every body, that hand right there is laid on has been healed. If you can get up here tonight, get that hand. Get that head of yours under that hand. For $150, amen. And it will be healed. I'm telling you, that hand right there laid hands on some that died. I've laid hands on some people that were depressed. When I got through praying, they were more depressed. <laughs> I learned years ago, sometimes life makes sense. Sometimes life don't make sense. I don't freak out, flip out, however you want to say it, when I'm perplexed. The difference in the meat and the milk, the boys and the men, the women and the girls, in the spirit, it's not what you do when you're on the mountain. It's what you do when you've sown everything you got and you're experiencing bad things happen to great people. It didn't turn out exactly like you wanted it to, but you have conditioned yourself, fighter, boxer, you have conditioned yourself on the mountain. You have not forgotten God in the prosperity in the great times. But you have prepared through training of the Holy Ghost that when the valley comes, that when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will then fear no evil because you know your God is with you in the valley just like he is on the mountain. And can I blow your spirit or your mind with this? And I want you to hear this. Please listen. Other than John 3.16 and Acts 2.4, the most quoted scripture. And all things work together for the good to them who were called according to his purpose. That love the Lord. Have you ever really checked that scripture out in the original Greek translation? Fits the message perfect. And all things work together for the good to them that fit themselves into the plan of God. It brings in, again, your free moral agent will. And all things work together for the good, yes, to those with their free moral agent will yes. who find out the will of God for their life and they set up just floating around, listen to me, like a butterfly, listen. They literally get into the will of God and they seek it. Yes. That's when all things, whether it looks bad or good, mm -hmm. the rain, rainy day, the cloudy day, or the sun shining, that's when it works together for the good. Now watch this tonight. I'm building this and we're going to see something. Because you don't understand why something has happened don't mean you never will. I want to say this to you. Don't get mad at God. In the midst of your perplexity, when you, when you pick the towel up and you feel the instinct to pick it up because you're about to throw it in. You're about to say, forget it. I'm done. Forget it all. I want you to remember this. Don't charge God for allowing it. Don't charge God for allowing it. And one more thing. I want you to understand this. Don't get mad at people. Don't charge God for allowing something. And don't get mad at people. Listen to this statement. God can use your bad circumstances. Here's the way he operates. For stepping stones to get you from one place to the other. But when you throw in the towel, you tie the hands of God. When you throw in the towel, you block your blessings. You have got to learn. Here's what I've done over the years. Severe attacks that I very seldom even preach about. You've got to learn in your spirit. This is a fruit of building up your spirit while you're on the mountain. So that when you get down the valley, you learn to refuse despair. And listen to this statement. If you have to bow for something inevitable, bow. The writer wrote and said, the tree that will bend before a gale 
will rise to face another. But if you refuse to bend through stubborn pride, that storm could totally and will snap you in two. Now I want to say this as a faith guy. I'm a faith preacher. Here's what many in the 80s in the faith movement of teaching forgot to tell the people. There's nothing wrong with trusting the sovereignty of God. Faith guy is acting like it was a cop-out for us to expect a miracle, but to trust the sovereignty of God. Understand from Genesis to Revelation. Quit studying faith sometime of the levels that you got to get to. Believe him. He's already told you that mustard seed faith would blow a mountain in the sea. Mustard seed faith will pick up anything that's in your way and move it. But until the moving of that mountain, until it disappears and you're facing it and hell's fighting it and things aren't working like you think it ought to and your wires have crossed and fuses are blowing, spiritually speaking, what do I do? I've learned over the years to trust the sovereignty of God. It's one of the most important things anybody can do. You know whether you fit yourself into His plan or not. You know whether you're loving God, seeking God. God knows whether you love Him or not. He knows you love Him, but sometimes He needs to burst something in you where you know that God knows you love Him. Right. You need to know that God knows that you love Him. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. A hair blows off your head. It's counted. It's numbered. You get a, a bottle of Rogaine. You, you, blow, you grow another one. God knows how to add it back. A sparrow hits the ground. He knows all about that. They're numbered. They're counted. He can tell you the hair on your head when you comb it this morning and it falls out. That's the 38,363rd hair that I grew on your head as a little boy or girl. They're counted. They're numbered. He's got everything in order. And He knows whether you want Him or not. Amen. Even in the midst of your frailty, in the midst of your faults, in the midst of your temptation battles, in the midst of whether you have picked up the towel or not, we have this treasure. Amen. And the faith bunch has got to understand this. We have this treasure, treasure, nine gifts, the fruit, the power to raise the dead. You hear me? But all along, it's in earthen vessels. It's still in vessels that are human, of clay. And it's okay to have feelings at times. It's okay to be human. you got to mark some things off to the sovereignty of God and expect a miracle. I tell people, tell evangelism, especially on the divine healing area, it's not prevalent and rampant like it once was. In the 80s, every guy on TV thought he couldn't preach nothing but divine healing and prosperity. 80s and 90s, divine healing and prosperity. Why? Because people give to that. Man will give any amount of money if he thinks he's going to get healed. He's got inoperable cancer and you're playing with his emotions. You got him thinking if he sows so much money into a ministry, right. never Calcutta, India, if you sow into Calcutta, you'll be healed? No. If you sow into this ministry, it's almost like selling, selling miracles for cancer for money. That if you give us an ultimate deception, ignorance, if you give a certain amount, cancer will leave. That was going on in the 80s and 90s. Thank God those died out. Nobody has them anymore. Because the only one getting rich was a preacher to the bank. The people were still dying because you can't buy a miracle by sowing, tithing, and offering. You can't buy a miracle on that. That isn't what it's all about. But I told someone, I said, they only film it when they're getting healed. They don't film the funerals. They don't film the funerals. They only film it when the people, so they had traveling evangelists that were the real deal. You saw us. We prayed for some that died. And in people's stupid mind, stupid spirit, they got to thinking, well, those, those big name tele preachers, pastors, or evangelists, we got to get to their meeting because that's where the healing is. Then they began to look at the local church like you couldn't get healed on a Sunday service here. So we got to get on the bus and go somewhere.